on for one of the wildest stories we've ever heard. It begins with small town police in Oklahoma pulling over a tractor trailer headed for Colorado. They think they have one of the largest marijuana bus in history, 17,000 pounds. The drivers explain it's just industrial hemp, the stuff that won't get you high. It's not marijuana. The police don't believe them. So four people, including a cannabis company founder from Colorado, get locked up facing drug trafficking charges that could bring 15 years to life. You can see these 60 boxes filled to the brim with marijuana. The mega marijuana bus made the local news in Oklahoma, tantalizing visuals and a shocking claim that drug runners didn't even try to disguise the contents of the semi truck coming through the small town of Pahuska. But is that what really happened? Andrew Ross of Aurora was in that second van. He's with Patriot Shield, veterans providing security services to the cannabis industry. I run a veteran-owned oh. company. This is absolutely important. Ross, a colleague, and two drivers are facing aggravated trafficking of marijuana charges that could bring 15 to life. There's a simple way to clear this up, a lab test for THC, to tell if this is harmless hemp, as they say, or one of the boldest marijuana smuggling runs of all time. But an attorney for one of the men says that federal drug labs nearby are closed for the government shutdown, so he doesn't know when they'll receive the tests back. Meanwhile, his clients are still in jail in Oklahoma. Ross, the Coloradan in the group, the guy with the beard, he posted his $40,000 bond tonight. A Louisville-based company tells us that was their half-million-dollar load of hemp coming here for processing. They say they specifically got assurances from the Oklahoma Department of Transportation that they were aware of the federal law and there was no issue bringing it through Oklahoma. This is a complicated and crazy story. So before this one blows up, let's step back and consider the scenarios. Scenario one. It really was industrial hemp on board. Totally legal. That police department thought it had the bust of the century and was completely wrong. And if we're going to Occam's razor this thing and say the simplest explanation is the best, that's the one you have to go with. Because otherwise, you have to believe that they were really trucking 17,000 pounds of black market weed across the country and giving Oklahoma a heads up that it was coming through. And then there's one final possibility, and this would be a wild one. What if the hemp wasn't fully or properly tested before it was shipped? It comes back from those lab tests high for THC, and that means that those guys were transporting an illegal product and did not even know it. Stay tuned. This is a wild one and it's just getting started. Putting taxpayer money where his mouth is, Governor Jared Polis revealed his plan to pay for full day kindergarten today and he hinted how the system could benefit teacher salaries. Full day kindergarten at no cost to families. That is one of Polis's promises that we have promised to watch. Now it is time for us finally to cross the finish line after decades of your work to fund free full day kindergarten by fall of 2019. Tomorrow, the governor, who's a Democrat, is going to present his budget request to the Democrats who control the state legislature and therefore state spending. But our Marshall Zellinger and those legislators know that Governor Polis is creating a math problem. Because of higher property values, many of you will be paying more in property taxes. That means you're contributing more to your local school district so the state doesn't have to. And that means the state has more money to play with. This proposal includes a $227 million that provides full funding for kindergarten across the state. Governor Jared Polis revealed that his plan to fund full day kindergarten will cost $227 million for one year. And if the state pays for kindergarten, school districts can spend the local school district money they had been spending on kindergarten elsewhere. A lot of school districts that are using their own funds um, to divert to pay for full day kindergarten and those funds will be freed up for, for other priorities like teacher pay or class size. I don't know that there's any reason any district would not want to participate. Ken DeLay is the executive director of the Colorado Association of School Boards, and school boards are where local school district funding decisions are made, like why some districts don't already offer full day kindergarten. In many instances, they don't do it because they don't have enough space to do it. In other words, they don't have the classroom space. On top of the $227 million to fund full-day kindergarten, the governor wants to spend $25 million for school districts to implement full-day kindergarten. You know, buying books, finding physical space. It's a plan Democrats on the Budget Committee are tapping the brakes on. We don't want to create any more unfunded mandates for our districts. 
So uh, whatever we, we do, we want to make sure that we're being fiscally prudent in the outlying years, because if we fund it this year, then we need to make sure that we're funding it in the out years too. The math problem created an English problem by different pronunciations of the word kindergarten. Uh, one thing you didn't hear is if the state has more money to fund full day K, maybe he has enough money for transportation. And that is the debate that no. will happen. Republicans want to have that debate. Democrats in the Joint Budget Committee want to have that debate because if you have this pot of money and we had two ballot issues about mm -hmm. funding for transportation, maybe some of that money should go there. If we got so much money, we should buy you a new microphone because yours isn't working. Marshall, thank you. <laughs> Denver Public Schools and the Teachers Association have three days now to reach a new contract or face the district's first strike since 1994. Teacher pay is the issue here. And this week we've seen some DPS teachers working the contract or working to the contract as they say. Basically it just means they no longer do all of the extra things they normally do, putting in the extra time, stuff for which they don't get paid. As we come closer to the point in negotiations where we really need some movement from the district, we want to show them that we're organized, that we have solidarity, that we're in it for each other. And, you know, if it comes to it, we will stand up for ourselves in order to stand up for our students. If a deal is not reached by Friday, then teachers can vote to strike on Saturday. The state has to give approval before they can actually go to the picket line. DPS is vowing to keep its classrooms open in case of a strike using substitute teachers and even giving lesson plans to non teaching staff. The state approved a teacher strike down in Pueblo last year. That one lasted five days, like the Denver public school strike of 1994. Our next question comes from a next viewer named Bob. Bob asks, I do not understand why the media tends to blame drug companies for all the deaths due to opioids when it, to me, really needs to be broken out to non-prescribed versus prescribed to show where the deaths are actually coming from. Who is the real boogeyman? Bob, the state health department says there were 1,012 overdose deaths in our state last year. 560 of them were from opioids. Of those, 370 were from prescribed drugs. So two thirds, <clears throat> pardon me, two thirds of Colorado's opioid overdose deaths were from prescribed drugs. That was probably not the answer you seem to be looking for, but those are what the numbers tell us. We have been taught to leave your retirement savings alone. It's not a safety net to draw on in hard times, unless apparently you are a government worker in the middle of a shutdown. There was a bill introduced today backed by Colorado's Democratic Congressman Ed Perlmutter that would allow federal employees to pull from their retirement savings without penalty. Here's our Anusha Roy. Let's start with the moment of Zen, because when we're talking about dipping into retirement funds because of a government shutdown, times are not good. It is alarming, but I think it's reality. Democratic U.S. Representative Ed Perlmutter from Colorado joined forces with some of his colleagues and introduced a bipartisan bill today. It would allow federal employees and some contractors to pull money out of their retirement accounts without paying a 10 percent penalty during a shutdown. I'd say I'm sorry. And... Uh... I know I'm working to try to minimize the stress that they're feeling. He got the idea from a Lakewood woman whose husband was furloughed three weeks ago. He decided to be a federal employee because he wanted to be patriotic and do something for the, you know, the public. So to treat somebody who's made that kind of a decision like this, well, it's just not right. But people who make money off of knowing money. At first blush, it scares me a lot. Think it sets the wrong precedent. And quite frankly, as a nation, we are horrible on saving for retirement. And even though Tom Stefaniak has clients yep. who've missed a paycheck, he's well, not absolutely, sold. Because you think about it, we're taking that money out of the 401k, so it's not invested. So how long is it not invested for? You have to remember there's federal income tax and state income tax as well. So which people would still have to pay if this bill is passed and would have up to three years to pay back what they ended up taking out. Now, Perlmutter said even if the government opens before this bill makes any more movement, Kyle, he still wants to see it through out of fear mm. that this could happen again. So one, we should note that Congressman Perlmutter is the only person in the Colorado delegation who told us that he's going to keep taking his paycheck during the right. shutdown. Two, he's not recommending that these people do this. He just... It's just an option, it's an option. is okay. what he's saying. All right, Anusha Roy, thank you. There's a big, beautiful castle in Colorado with a name that trips some people up. Speaking of words that are unfamiliar to our ear, let's learn a few from the cowboys and cowgirls at the National Western Stock Show. When we were in the ambulance, she was apologizing to us for 
taking us away from her day. But no apology needed, because they're some of the good ones. Oh God, I was so grateful they were there. They ditched their coffee break to help a woman in need. That's next. Hi there, I'm Kathy Saban. It was another beautiful day in Denver, but things are going to change. We're tracking a powerful California storm that's going to bring more snow to the high country and maybe colder weather and snow to Denver again on Friday. Not sure what it is with this Friday snow thing. We're already down to 30 at the airport. Winds are shifting, coming in out of the south this hour and will be increasing along the front range foothills. The first wave ahead of the main California storm is coming into the Colorado high country. The area is shaded in orange. That's an avalanche watch. The snowpack is unstable. We've got wind driven snow coming. The main core system is going to dig into the southwest and come across Colorado on Friday and then we've got a good chance of accumulating snow right here in Denver. Also some cold air to the north so we're kind of getting that squeeze play on the front range. Snow in the mountains tonight and tomorrow. Denver will be cloudy cool and dry. Our changes again coming at the end of the week. Tonight, calm and cloudy are low at 25. Cold start to your Wednesday. Highs near 50. We have a warmer day coming up Thursday with one to three inches of snow Friday. Clearing for Saturday. Another storm and another chance for snow on Monday. Kyle. Thank you, Kathy. For tonight's edition of What Do You Say? We are talking about that big, beautiful castle in Denver's Montclair neighborhood off 12th and Pontiac. It's named after the German guy who built it back in 1887. Do you know the name? If you grab a map, you'll see there's a parkway and a place in the city also named after him. Rachel wrote in, curious how to properly pronounce his name. So we turn to Tom Noel, Dr. Colorado as he's known, to ask, what do you say? Rick Tolfen. And that is named for the Baron Walter B. von Richthofen, who founded the town of Montclair. And the Richthofen Castle is quite a wonder in East Denver to this day. It was his show home for the town of Montclair, where all the homes were supposed to be castles. But I happen to live in that neighborhood, and uh, most of us have much more modest homes. The castle most recently sold in 2012 for 3.4 mil. It's being renovated by the new owners. And you cannot talk about Richthofen and his castle without mentioning that he was the uncle of the Red Baron, you know, the famous German fighter pilot during World War I. All right, send us to another place name in our state, one that you hear mangled coming out of the mouths of our neighbors. Email next at 9news.com or get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. You ever been to the stock show and seen a bug on a cow? Do you know what bracing a lamb means? No, just blank stares? Fear not. 
Madison Sons back from North Dakota and Clancy Anderson with the stock show offered to clue us in on some stock show slang. Here at the National Western, I feel like there's really something for everyone to learn. Oh, he's wagging his tail. tail. Look, he's wagging his tail. An example of a word that we use that people who didn't grow up exhibiting livestock wouldn't know what it meant is we call it rinsing cattle. So in the mornings, we bring our cattle in, and it's basically giving them a bath. A bug is one of the nose rings that you might see in one of the really big bulls, right? And all that does is it ensures safety for the handlers. One more term that I would use is what we call the tie out. And you can't leave your cattle in the barns at night. So we take them out to our own individual spots every night and leave them out there for the evening. You might see these really high powered hair dryers, right? We call those blowers. We call that fitting or grooming and clipping, right? And they'll use hand scissors, they'll use uh, a lot of times andis clippers on them. What they're standing in is usually a blocking chute. From where we are up here, we call this the hill. And if you go underneath the railroad tracks to the west, those are called the stockyards. You can brace a lamb, you can set up cattle, and you can drive pigs. One last term that I would want everybody to know is what we call the show ring. And that's where the reason why everybody comes here and they exhibit their cattle. The coolest thing about seeing people get connected with agriculture is that they learn where their food comes from or how agriculture works. That lamb getting blow dried at the end was my second favorite thing. My first favorite were all the kids in the piece going, National Western runs through Sunday, January 27th. This woman and her dog riding in style, they're the most Colorado thing we've seen today. You know, all I can say is thank you because there's no other words to express how grateful I am. Grateful the two paramedics happen to be taking a coffee break. That's next.
For years now here, we've honored the public servants who do the right thing day in and day out and rarely get noticed on the news. They are the good ones, as we love to note, they're almost all good ones. Like the paramedics from Aurora Fire Station 1. They saved Janice Winter last November. Janice has been waiting to thank them, and today was the day. Are these the guys? All these the firemen that did it? Uh, Tyler Smith, Clay Thomason, uh, Alex Newturk and myself, Ben Ross, were the ones on the Aurora Fire Department, uh, Engine 1. Are they all happy about this? To come back and be able to talk to us after something that we did is absolutely amazing, and it makes all of us feel extremely proud of what we did. Hi! You looked a lot better than the last time we saw you. I know it! Thanks to you guys! <laughs> How are you? Doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Hi, I'm and doing great. And this is the young good. man that helped us right away. Uh-huh. Yeah, are you the one right that there. said, take my hands? That's Ben right here. Oh, Ben. Ben, <laughs> ben that's all I remember yeah. is I yeah. smiled and that's it. <laughs> it was a miracle and they were there and we wanted to show some kind of a thank you. That was the first time I have ever been at the same place a cardiac arrest <laughs> occurred. So it's, it's definitely a rare event. When I got out of the car, we were going to Stanley Marketplace, a bunch of us, about 30 of us, and about uh, 10, 12 steps away from the car, I knew I was in terrible trouble. Yeah, she did a little face plant right into, right into his chest. And of course, I collapsed right on him. So the fact that we were able to get CPR immediately from when her heart stopped, uh, that tremendously affected her ability to recover as well as she did. I'm doing great. Got a pacemaker. Every time I see a fireman now, I'm going to remember. There's just no, there's nothing that can really express how you feel. But I'll never forget any of them. Winter's a member of the Red Hat Society. It's a society group for women. She gives credit to her fellow members for quickly letting those paramedics know that she needed help that day. When we return, the most Colorado thing we saw today, a great question from you about our lead story on the marijuana bust confusion, and one of you thinks I am impersonating a Denver legend. That's next.
The most Colorado thing we saw today is a pair twinning on the road. Natalie Stallsworth taking a ride around Bear Creek Lake Park with her dog Paisley. Paisley's got her own special backpack and the doggles. Doggles, you know, is a is a trademark term, just like Kleenex or dumpster. How about that? P Natalie admits Paisley is a little spoiled. Send your most Colorado things to next at 9news.com. Thank you to Edie and Donna and Bretta who all point out that I misidentified the animal seen quickly at the end of the National Western Stock Show piece. It was a goat, not a lamb. I'm going to say quickly to excuse my mistake. Dan Morgan writes in from Centennial wondering why that shipment of industrial hemp or marijuana, depending on who you believe, was coming through Oklahoma on its way to Colorado. He says, look at a map. It's nowhere near the route. According to the company that says that it purchased that hemp to process here, they called ahead to ask which states were going to hassle them, and they say they got the all clear to bring it through Oklahoma. That's the craziest story I've seen in a long time. Something's going to happen on that, and I think it's going to happen soon. And finally, tonight from Kendra, she says, Kyle, you're just two red eyes away from impersonating Blucifer. You don't like my outfit. That's a shame. I'll see you next time.